Hello church, my name is Shelly. And my name is Chris, and welcome to Monterey Church Online. We're so glad that you joined us today. In just a moment, we're going to study God's Word, the Bible, together. And then, after the message, stick around because we'll share a couple ways for you to further grow in your faith and get connected with our Monterey Church family. Also, if you're looking for worship music to enhance today's online experience and to enjoy throughout the week, be sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll be posting powerful moments from our Sunday Gathering Weekly. All right, it's time for the message. Let's prepare our hearts to encounter and respond to God's Word together. Hey church, my name is Mike. I am the teaching pastor here at Monterey Church Online. I want to say welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It is always an honor and a privilege to be with you. Uh, it's been a hard week for me. I've had a sore throat uh, since Monday, which has been um, just so annoying. And as I was doing some sermon prep about 30 minutes ago, I cut my tongue on a cough drop. Didn't know that was possible, but it is. Um, so we're going to see how this goes, but the word must go on. Amen? Um, listen, before we jump into God's word today, I did, I did want to encourage you, as we talked a little bit about last week, uh, that you know, as apprentices of Jesus, as disciples, as those who, who practice the ways of Jesus, we recognize the call. Uh, to be people who are radically generous. We're generous. We, we, we love others and we give of our time, of our talent, of our treasure, of our abilities, of our finances, of our lives, of everything. All because, like we have it all in open hands, ready to give as God calls us to give, all because he first loved us, all because Jesus gave everything for us. And we know that as we do that, we're not only living according to his will, but at the same time, we trust that God will be, you know, that he'll radically provide on our behalf. That as we sow into the kingdom, so shall we reap the kingdom of God in many different ways. And so with all that being said, listen, as we come up on the end of the year here, end of 2022, I want to simply encourage you to pray and consider what your heart for our house end of year special offering might look like for you. We know that God is moving mightily through our house, Monterey Church, online and in person. Uh, we know that he's changing lives from the inside out. I want to encourage you to go to uh, the testimony page on our YouTube channel and check out all the latest testimonies that have come through our church. We know that God is transforming hearts and we believe that the best is yet to come, that there are big plans for us in 2023 and beyond, and that just takes faithful investment. And we also know that you know true generosity, radical generosity and stewardship is often not spontaneous, but it's intentional, it's calculated, it's planned, it's prayed over, it's budgeted. And so I just wanna encourage you to be intentional, to ask yourself and to pray to God this week. Like, have I been obedient to give as he's called me to give this year? Is there anything above and beyond you know, my normal tithe that I can offer in worship to God and for the benefit of his church for the future in 2023. I just want to encourage you to pray about that. Our uh, heart for our house offering this year to end the year. Okay, let's pray. And then we will jump into God's word together. Jesus, we love you. You're the best. We thank you for all that you are all that you've done. We thank you for knitting us together and bringing us together through your spirit. Though we may be separated, though we're on our phones and on our laptops and on TVs, wherever we may be, we know, Lord, that you've drawn us close to you. And we know, Lord, that your word is alive, that it's active, that it's sharper than a two-edged sword, that it pierces that it pierces our hearts, Lord. And so I pray that you would, would you speak to us today? And as you speak, would you enable us, each of us, to hear you and to respond to you, Jesus. Draw us close to you. Help us to abide in you as you abide in us. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said with me today, 
Amen. Amen. Hey, when it comes to uh, faith, when it comes to uh, trusting God at his word, when it comes to um, being obedient to God and his will, what are you most afraid of? I want you to think about that. What are you most afraid of? I think we're all afraid in different ways. We're back in the 13 letter series today. We have two more weeks after today. uh, And we're picking up where our elder Matt left off last week. We're gonna be in Paul's second letter to uh, his apprentice, Timothy. Um, And this is where Paul actually covers the topic of faith and fear. Very simple terminology. We're going to get to that in a second. But before we do so, a couple things to remind ourselves about Timothy, of who he was. Remember, he was a young apprentice of Paul's who was actually put in charge of pastoring uh, this church in Ephesus, this growing church. This is, you know, Ephesus was a thriving city. It was a diverse port city. It was a rich city. It was, it was growing in many different ways in uh, the ancient Mediterranean world. And so leading that church in Ephesus, it came with pressure. It came with conflict. It came with challenges, not only, you know, with a, um, you know, culture outside of the church in many ways, you know, pagan culture, worshiping all these different gods. But at the same time, there was pressure within the church. And so Timothy had a lot on his shoulders. So Paul, he actually wrote two personal letters, First and Second Timothy, two, I would say they're pastoral letters designed specifically to encourage and to instruct Timothy. That's what they're mainly designed for. But at the same time, they were meant to be shared with the church at large. I think what's most notable about Second Timothy here as we dig in is that as you read uh, Paul's letters chronologically, 2 Timothy is actually the last one. That it's that this letter was written during Paul's final Roman imprisonment, where he probably knew that he was very soon going to be executed for preaching the gospel, uh, which means he probably knew that this was most likely his final recorded words that he was sending out. And so, listen, you can imagine that you know, as we all do, when when a loved one is, you know, on the brink of death and is offering their final words of like wisdom, right? That we lean in, like the world pauses to lean in. Like we want to, you know, we want to pay close attention to what they have to say. In the same way, I really do believe Timothy is taking this letter and he's leaning in, like he's hanging on to Paul's every single word here. I read 2 Timothy as like Paul's most personal letter. Like this is a letter written from, uh, you know, a spiritual father to a son. He's passing the torch. He's expressing his deep love and admiration for his protege. He's, you know, sharing, you know, the deepest wisdom and um, most significant lessons that he's learned over time in these few chapters. And you know, he does so as he reminds Timothy some of the big major themes of 2 Timothy is, uh, you know, reminding him to teach the truth, to stand for truth, to teach the truth, uh, to endure suffering, uh, to, to work hard, to remain faithful. And in fact, today, what I'd like to focus on is actually one more just profound exhortation from the Apostle Paul uh, to his protege, Timothy, that I, I really do believe it's not only meant for him, but it's meant for the entire church. It's meant for you and me. And what we'll see is actually Paul, he knew something that was going on with Timothy, like something within his faith, like this struggle, this, you know, Timothy was wrestling with something that perhaps no one else, as he was leading the church, no one else really kind of knew about. And so he took the time to encourage Timothy in the midst of his struggle. So we pick it up in 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 5. I'm only going to read a few verses here. It says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, Paul says to Timothy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. 
And so what we see here is Timothy, he's a generational Christian, um, second generation, uh, putting his faith in Jesus. It's a sincere faith. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So in other words, what Paul's saying there is this, I, I, listen, Timothy, I see your struggle. I know your struggle. And I want you to revive, to intensify, and to stir up what the Holy Spirit has equipped you with in order to fulfill your kingdom purpose there in Ephesus with those people. Now, for Timothy, uh, you know, you read through um, some of Paul's letters, you read through Acts, what you see is for Timothy, this was, you know, he was given these supernatural gifts and these abilities to lead and to teach and to preach the gospel, uh, which God was using there in Ephesus. These were gifts that he didn't earn. These are spiritual gifts that you and I, you know, we don't earn, we don't deserve, we don't go to school for these things. You can read about the gifts in uh, Romans chapter 12 and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They're kind of spread throughout there. Um, But, you know, these are spiritual gifts that are given by God, given through his Holy Spirit, that they're grafted into Timothy's life, into our life for the sake of the mission that Christ has given us to go and make disciples of all nations, of all people. And so Paul's saying, look, like, don't forget the Holy Spirit. Follow the Holy Spirit. Trust the Holy Spirit. Don't neglect him. Don't stifle him. Don't quench the Holy Spirit and his work. And then he goes on in verse seven. He says, for, like, here's the reason. There's the conjunction, right? For the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid. Now, I want to stop there. Pause. Because here's the struggle that Paul sees with Timothy. That when it came to his faith, uh, when it came to, you know, leading the church in Ephesus, when it came to stepping out into his calling and into his purpose, when it came to following Jesus in many ways, there, there was a part of Timothy that was afraid. There was a part of Timothy that lacked courage. And listen, you might blame it on maybe his personality. You might blame it on the fact that he was young. You might blame it on, you know, the fact that there was, you know, major opposition that he faced from all these false teachers in the area. Or, or maybe, you know, the, the, the sake that, you know, he may have been like ashamed or embarrassed of the gospel or of Jesus or even, you know, his association with Paul, or maybe it came from just all the pressure and the responsibility that was on his shoulders. Whatever it was, Timothy had become enslaved to fear. And now listen, I have to admit to myself here, um, there's a little, you know, pharisaical piece inside of me that looks at Timothy's situation. And I'm like, come on, Timothy. Like, seriously, like you're, you're one of Paul's boys. Like you're hanging with the Apostle Paul. You're receiving words from the Apostle Paul. You're hanging with people who hung with Jesus. Like you've been blessed in so many ways. You've been given these gifts. You've been sent out. You're you're in this amazing leadership role in this church, in this thriving city of Ephesus. You've been given all these amazing supernatural abilities. What's there really to be afraid of? That's the Pharisee inside of me. But at the same time, I know, and I think all of us, we have to say this too, we all have to repent here because, you know, when it comes to our faith, when it comes to obedience to God's word, when it comes to sharing, you know, the gospel with our coworker, with our neighbor, with our friend, with our family, when it comes to following, you know, the Holy Spirit, where he leads us, when it comes to leading and loving others like Jesus, you know, I could take a measurement of my own life. I think we can all take a measurement of our own lives. And I can say that we, I think we constantly wrestle with fear. And you can cast that fear off on, you know, a personality trait, or maybe it's, um, maybe we're, you know, we're afraid because of uh, commitment. We don't want to commit to where God is leading us. Um, maybe, you know, we're afraid uh, because we don't want to fail. We don't want to experience criticism. Uh, we don't want to miss out on something. 
Uh, if we have to sacrifice in that way, we don't want to lose the people that we love. We don't want to lose control. I know for myself, like I, you know, when it comes to faith and when it comes to fear, I often wrestle with feeling unqualified and feeling like um, ill-equipped to move forward and to trust God in this way uh, or that way or whatever it may be. Maybe you feel the same way. And I can tell you, man, there's so much danger in that, right? Because it's this fear, as we see with Timothy and we see with us, it's this fear that keeps us from walking in our kingdom purpose. It's this fear that will keep us from encountering the blessings of God. It's this fear that will keep us from building and creating and governing and participating in all the things that God has called and equipped us for. And I think most importantly, it's this fear that will threaten the advancement of the gospel that neutralizes our capacity to truly live and love like Jesus. And so Paul recognizes this in Timothy. I believe Paul recognized, you know, these feelings of fear within himself um, and certainly within the church at large. And so he made sure that the church received this foundational truth back in verse 7 for the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid in other words Timothy when you're afraid church when you're afraid know that your fear isn't from God that's first and foremost that he didn't plant that fear inside of you that he didn't create you for that fear in fact timidity And Christianity, they're incompatible with one another and they're not meant to coexist. That the spirit that God gave you does not make you timid. And so when God says, take the job, when God says, make the move, when God says, love your neighbor as yourself, when God says, forgive that person who hurt you, when God says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and sacrificed for her. When, when, when God says, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. When he says these things and he instructs these things and we hesitate because of some sort of fear or some sort of timidity, know that that's not from God. That's not God saying like the timing's off here. That's not God saying that, you know, obviously, you know, you're not ready or you're not capable of, you know, my calling here for the spirit that God gave us does not make us afraid, but gives us power, Paul says, love and self-discipline, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. And so Paul here is reminding you and me that as followers and as apprentices of Jesus, our fear is transformed into boldness, into faithful boldness through the Spirit of God. That those who have repented of their sin recognize that their sin has separated them from God. And we've repented of our sin. We've turned from our wicked ways. Those who have surrendered their life to Jesus as Lord and as Savior, those who have been forgiven of their sin and received uh, the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's His Holy Spirit, Paul says, that gives us power. Not timidity, not fear, but power. And Paul's saying, look, it's not, it's not physical power, it's not influential power, it's not persuasive power, it's not some sort of power, Timothy, that you can conjure up on your own or that you know, the world you know, offers or how the world sees power, but it's power in the form of heavenly authority, that he has sent you out with heavenly authority, that as we walk by faith and as we're obedient to his will, it's the same power. Uh, that has authority over the heavens and the earth. The same power that has authority over life and over death, over disease and over famine. The same power that has authority to save and to redeem, to restore, to deliver and to heal. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, defeated death, defeated sin, defeated hell, goes before you. That you are a person, Timothy, that we are a people marked 
with the power of God. Paul says in the book of Romans that we've been adopted into the sonship of God through Christ. Therefore, we are no longer slaves to fear. That we, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, sealed with the authority of heaven. That means that no matter the circumstance, no matter what God is calling you to, no matter the sacrifice that he's calling you to make to deny yourself in one way or another, when the Father sees you, he sees Jesus in you. When Satan sees you, when you come up against you know, uh, trials and tribulations, when Satan sees you, when demons see you, they see resurrection power in you. They see the authority of heaven watching over you and supporting you. They see you being safe and secure in his hands. And so the spirit that God gave us doesn't make us afraid, but gives us power gives us heavenly authority. Secondly, Paul says that, you know, our fear is transformed to boldness as the Holy Spirit gives us love, which I think is interesting, you know, when thinking about um, overcoming fear. Uh, but Paul, he doesn't like mince his words here. He, he knew that power and love they actually work in tandem with one another. That the primary purpose of empowering God's people was to equip them to love others as he first loved us. To value and to serve, to love others with power and with authority from heaven. I think a really, really powerful example of this uh, comes from the book of John chapter 13, and this is the night before Jesus was betrayed and then eventually crucified, and he knew all this was about to happen. And so it says in John 13 verse 2, it was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew, this is important. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority, power over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So Jesus knew uh, of his own power. He knew of his authority from heaven. You would expect, as he was about to be betrayed, you would expect him to confront Judas You'd expect him to defeat the devil right there on the spot in some sort of like major flashy way, right? But instead, what you see from Jesus, who's all powerful, who's in authority over everything. So he got up from the table, verse four, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then in the most, you know, if we understand the culture, then in the most radical and shocking act of, of humility and love, he began to wash the disciples' feet, including Judas, his betrayer, drying them with the towel he had around him. And so this is just one of the examples of Jesus, right? Like you can see throughout his whole life, ultimately culminating on the cross, that Jesus used his power and his authority over heaven and earth to, to love and to serve others. He, he tells us that the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life, to sacrifice everything, to give over everything as a ransom for many. And it's his spirit indwelling in us that empowers us to do the same, to love to sacrifice, to serve others in ways that we can't figure out, we can't produce on our own, in ways that make no sense to us or the people around us, to love others in ways that counter culture, to love others in ways that counter our flesh. He gives us this supernatural capacity to, to, to love, to forgive those who hurt us deeply, to forgive our worst enemies, to hold no record of wrongs. He gives us a supernatural capacity to love in the form of denying ourselves, our time, our talent, our treasure for the sake of others. Love in the form of patience and kindness towards those who are the most difficult to be patient with. He gives us a supernatural capacity to love in the form of, um, you know, just contentment and humility, um, just staying humble uh, instead of being envious and proud. 
And so through the Holy Spirit, what Paul's teaching Timothy here is that not only does he have power, not only do we have power, heavenly authority, at the same time we have this capacity to love like Jesus, but finally, and I would say arguably the most important, our fear is transformed to boldness, faithful boldness in Christ as the Holy Spirit gives us self-discipline. Now listen, don't check out here, like don't, don't. Um, don't turn off your device simply because you heard the word discipline, right? I think oftentimes we hear the word discipline, especially in church, and we're like, oh, I don't know. I don't want anything to do with that, right? But Paul's not talking about discipline in terms of punishment. He's talking about uh, discipline in terms of wisdom, discipline in terms of control. In fact, um, if you did uh, a study of the root word, of self-discipline there in the ancient Greek, it means a sound mind or a sober mindedness, which is important. So you could read this verse and maybe you've heard this verse before this way, like the King James version says, the Holy Spirit gives us power and love and a sound mind or self-discipline, um, which I think is just absolutely critical, especially for the you know followers of Jesus who are wrestling with some sort of fear in some way, shape, or form, because scripture makes it very clear that the mind, the mind is a battlefield. Paul tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 8, that the mind governed by the flesh is death. That apart from Jesus, our minds will naturally grow timid. Our, not, our minds will naturally be fearful. That apart from Jesus, our minds will easily become panicked and confused and disordered. We see this in the world, right? Uh, apart from Jesus, our, our minds will constantly be overwhelmed with uncontrollable thoughts and emotions. But Paul continues on, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. I'm reminded of that verse in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, which says, You, Lord, he's speaking to the Lord, you, Lord, keep him in perfect peace, perfect shalom, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And so ultimately what Paul's reminding Timothy, reminding us today is by grace, through radical faith, through even a mustard seed of faith, in the life and in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior, as we trust in Him, not only are our sins forgiven, not only are our hearts made new, renewed, but our minds are transformed into the mind of Christ that Jesus transforms our uncontrolled minds and gives us a controlled, clear, calm mind. That in Christ we have a mind that is wise, that's unchanging, that's in order, a mind that practices sound judgment, a mind that discerns you know, the love and the mercy of the grace of God that, that can see his love, mercy, and grace more clearly. A mind that desires to resist sin and to please God. He gives us a mind that helps us to think and to act with heavenly sobriety, heavenly wisdom, and a mind to help us just stay grounded in practicing, in putting into practice uh, you know, the ways of Jesus. And so in some of Paul's final words to his uh, protege, Timothy, as he was passing on the torch, he encouraged and he exhorted over Timothy, for the spirit that God gave us doesn't make us timid, doesn't make us afraid, Timothy, but gives us power and love and self-discipline or sound mind. And so the question now is, well, okay, like what do we, what do, we do with that? Uh, well, I think first, we got to recognize our very own fears. 
And I think we all have them. Like when it comes to our faith, when it comes to God, when it comes to his word, when it comes to his will, ask ourselves like, what am I most afraid of? Uh, is it a fear of missing out on something? Is it a fear of sacrificing um, a part of my flesh that I want to hold on to? Is it a fear of um, losing someone? What am I most afraid of? And then once we recognize our fear, we repent. And we say, Lord, this isn't from you. This is my flesh moving in another direction. And then we receive Jesus. We abide in Jesus. We get back to Jesus. We get back into his word, back into his truth and his promises. We put our faith and our trust in Jesus. We surrender to him as our Lord and as our Savior uh, of our heart and of our soul and of our mind. The perfect Son of Man and the perfect Son of God who laid down his life, who gave everything through the cross, dying for our sins, atoning for our sins, raising to new life three days later so that you and I, through faith in the resurrected King Jesus, may be forgiven and transformed from the inside out. So we receive, we, we abide in Jesus. And then as we move forward, I think we continue to stay in his word and we stay grounded in prayer, asking God for just a fresh outpouring of power and of authority from heaven, a fresh outpouring of love, an open door to love, a fresh outpouring of self-discipline, of a sound mind, of self-control in order to practice and continue in the ways of Jesus. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you for who you are, for all that you've done for us. Lord, we wanna be bold. We know, Lord, that we've been called to be bold believers who step out into the marketplace, into the world, into our callings, into our purposes, boldly and courageously trusting you, Lord. But we all also acknowledge our fear and our timidity. And so I pray, dear God, that you would help us recognize these places in our life that we're holding on to. Help us to acknowledge, Lord, that they are of the flesh, that they're not of you, and that you have given us the spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline of a sound mind. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for always being with us, for never leaving us, never forsaking us. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And we know the best is yet to come. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus, have questions about today's teaching, or if you'd like to explore your next steps of faith, please check out our website or our app and click the Get Connected button. And speaking of our app, make sure you download it today. The Monterey Church app is our digital discipleship tool full of resources and ways to help us grow to live and love like Jesus. Also, if you were impacted by today's message and would like to partner with Monterey Church in sharing the good news of Jesus, you can do so by clicking on the Give page of our website or app. Finally, if you live in the Monterey area and you would like to connect in person, check out these upcoming events, including a quick overview of what you can expect at our in-person Sunday gatherings at the Golden State Theater in downtown Monterey. Have, Have a, a great, great week. week.
Hey there, and welcome to Monterey Church. I wanted to give you a quick rundown of what you can expect here on Sunday mornings. One of the benefits of being located right in the heart of downtown Monterey is there are a ton of great places to grab coffee before the service. And I know I love exploring the amazing restaurants here on Alvarado Street after the service. Also, since we are located right in downtown Monterey, you may be wondering where to park. The good news is there is a ton of free street parking available on Sundays, as well as a few public lots and parking garages, all within a block from the church. For our families with young children, we have a dedicated facility just for your kids. We call it Go City, with each age group learning about Jesus in a way that is specific to their age and stage in life. We guarantee your child will have a blast learning about Jesus and meeting new friends. Our check-in process is simple. Doors open 15 minutes before service, and using our tablets, you'll be able to check in your kids and drop your child off with one of our trained Go Kids leaders. Before your first visit, you can even fill out our family registration form on our website to make the process even quicker. Just a few steps from our children's facility is the historic Golden State Theater, where the adults meet for our Sunday church experience. Our lobby is where we hang out and catch up before and after service. And don't forget to stop by our welcome desk where you can connect with a leader who will assist you in getting connected with our Monterey Church community. Our middle school and high school students meet upstairs in the balcony for the beginning of the service, but then meet in separate small groups during the service. At 10 a.m., our service begins. In our services, we worship God through prayer, music, generosity, and the reading and studying of the Bible. Our focus is growing to live and love more like Jesus. But no matter where you are on your faith journey or what you believe, you are welcome here. There's a lot of information on our website at monterey.church, and feel free to reach out to us at info at if you have any questions. We hope to see you this Sunday at 10 a.m. Hey.